so been hacking on free and open source software for a long time now, like almost eight, almost 20 years. Going back, if you can find my old posts on Debian Devel, I helped out with the PowerPC port and like hacked on Emacs and stuff. Long time hacking them. Um, I love it, and I'm gonna keep doing it. Been in been in the OS space for a long time. Uh, and now I'm in the CoreOS group at Red Hat, which I think is just a very cool thing to say. So it was actually, it kind of boggles my mind that it was just a year ago that I was coming back from the last dev conf, back to Boston. Uh, I was on my plane, it landed, I turned on my phone, and holy cow, <laughs> my phone just exploded. Um, yeah, because Red Hat announced we were acquiring CoreOS. So now I'll be honest with you. At that time, I mean, so I helped create Atomic Host for Red Hat, and it was a direct competitor. I mean, it was a direct response to CoreOS Container Linux because Container Linux was getting an immense amount of traction, even from people who were paying RHEL subscribers. They said, we love this model, and we like Container Linux. And I was on some calls with some customers who were like, why don't you do this? And yeah. So when Red Hat acquired CoreOS, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, a lot of uncertainty. What does this mean? What's gonna happen? Um, there's so much overlap, right? And obviously at the same time, there are other products too, but a lot of uncertainty. So um, I'm gonna tell you a lot about what we've been doing for the past year, and I think it's pretty cool. So before I dive into that though, I wanna talk a little bit about, I mean, I, I kinda mentioned this at the, top, the first, but why I'm here specifically is to hack on free and open source software. I, just, I think it's very important for our society. Like, if you look at software today, it's like electricity. You know, Electricity laid a foundation for our society. Everything depends on it now. And the same is true of software. You know, every industry now, you have to hire software engineers, right? You have to get involved in software. Maybe you're doing machine learning for you know, your crop growth or something like that and crunching data. I mean, it's everywhere. It's pervasive in our society. Everyone, nearly everyone has a cell phone and you know, it's, it just, it's everyone in our society. And the thing is, proprietary software takes away a lot of control over your life from, because you just can't change it, right? If you, yeah, I'll, I'll, I think that sort of goes without saying. I read a news article a while ago about how some TV manufacturers are now basically just gathering data on what you watch and just sending that and that's actually, allowed them to reduce the cost of the TV a lot. And I just, the stuff like that, that's just, I think that's pretty evil. You know, like we should be in control of our software and devices. I th yeah, and free and open source software is a counterbalance to that. Now, so I'm in the OpenShift group, part of Core, the CoreOS group is part of OpenShift. And why specifically OpenShift? Like how do I take that passion for free and open source software into this? Well, it turns out that same sort of thing about control also applies not just to, from people, it also applies for businesses, right? If you're a business and you outsource some, if let's say you outsource your database to a third party service, you're outsourcing a lot of your business, right? You're out, if that database goes down and that vendor isn't responsive, you're kind of just screwed, right? So, and the, you know, especially in the public cloud space, I mean, the rise of proprietary services, some of these are very good. Very compelling, you know, and I think the future is a hybrid, right? I don't think we're going to ever, free and open source software is never gonna defeat proprietary software, but we have to be there to counterbalance it to give you free and open source software options. So not only are we are making, Kubernetes has gained a lot of traction as an abstraction layer so that you can take these same containers, deploy them to public cloud, take them on premise, right? The exact same app. And that's actually part of, we owe a lot of credit to Sullivan Heights who invented Docker for this original Docker manifesto of you know, a container that you should be able to take around. And that's a lot of why we're here. Um, and so we're not just making a, an infrastructure layer, you, know, you can also get a build of Postgres, for example, from our registry. That's a big deal, right? A couple of years ago, I might not have thought that would happen, that Red Hat would ship a container, a Postgres container that can run exactly the same way inside Kubernetes across public and private cloud. Now, obviously, in order to run containers, you need an operating system. And Red Hat got a lot of traction. I mean, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is by far the biggest product, right? And 
There's a lot of things you could say about Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, I think one of the number one things in the, in the software space is just the length of that life cycle. The idea that, you know, so many people, it's easy to create something, it's hard to maintain it over time. People want to deploy their software and then go on to do other more valuable things, right? They don't want to spend a lot of time maintaining it. And Red Hat Enterprise Linux, if you installed RHEL 5, which was 2007 or something like that, um, you could still buy extended lifecycle support for that. That's a long time, right? And for a lot of these businesses who have, you know, maybe you deploy a server in your factory or something like that, it's a pretty compelling value, right? But containers fundamentally change how we think about the operating system in so many ways. We, uh, remember when Docker first came out, um, we were talking about this, one of the, People at Red Hat was saying uh, how one of our very most senior engineers was saying, hey, so when we go to build software, we build it in the container. You know, right now a lot of the software is built in, uh, you know, RPMs were built, are built inside a, this mock. It's like true, and it has some container features. It's kind of old school because it predates, long predates Docker. But, you know, he said, wait, we build software in containers. Why don't we run them that way, right? And he was right. Right? Now, containers impact a lot how you manage that software. So, you know, it's kind of took the rise of Kubernetes to not just say, okay, well, we have this file system tree. It's also all this infrastructure built around it. And I think, you know, part of it is actually the Docker layering thing, the idea where you derive from a base image. It's actually very clever, not something you get from Mock. Um, yeah, and so containers change how we think about that operating system. And the rise of CoreOS, which was renamed to Container Linux, and then, as I mentioned, Atomic Host, was a lot in response to how do we think about that operating system now that containers exist. And so, just for those who don't know, basically, CoreOS came out, and it, it, it's actually, the history is very interesting, because it's, Chrome OS used some Gentoo technology, and then CoreOS forked from Chrome OS, and so it's, you know, it's a very, it's kind of has that heritage with uh, Chrome OS. Um, but so they had a sort of, they have a sort of dual partition updating system, and then everything else runs in Docker. And so Docker was the thing that was embedded, shipped with the OS, and the idea is you run all your apps with Docker. And they actually prototyped out some, this toolbox command where the idea if you do log into a host, you know, you can debug things from it. So container focused and auto updating is a really big deal. Uh, if you listen to, uh, some talks, you know, I think as far as creating things and maintaining it, auto updates by default are a bold move. It changes how you think about the OS. I'm gonna go into that a little bit. Um, so CoreOS had not just the OS, um, but also a distribution of Kubernetes called Tectonic. And to summarize a lot of things very briefly, Tectonic was a lot more focused on the operational side Whereas in OpenShift, it was, well, there was a lot of higher level things. For example, OpenShift by default comes with the concept of a build, right? And actually, and triggering from Git and all that stuff that's not part of Kubernetes. Uh, if it was all designed today, it would probably be CRDs and custom operators, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, it was very developer focused and it had an installer that sort of had what you could call an undercloud written in Ansible. So, sort of interesting, and created a lot of tension. So the idea, a lot of the ideas with Tectonic are that the cluster was self-driving, and that's a lot of that DNA that we've taken over to OpenShift 4. Okay, so that's all the background now. So what is Red Hat CoreOS? Red Hat CoreOS is DNA from all these different things. We have Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we have CoreOS, we have Atomic, it's also inheriting technology from Tectonic and OpenShift. Now, if I say that to you, you probably say, are we playing buzzword bingo or something? <laughs> it's okay if you guys yell at bingo. So it, it's harder, I, this is just how, this is, it's harder to uh, simplify it more than this. Oh yeah, and it derived from Fedora CoreOS. Forgot to mention that. So we're gonna unpack this a little bit. I mentioned that Container Linux is derived from Gen 2. Now, things could have gone, and, and I mentioned that there are rel customers today that use it. There are non rel customers that use it that we would like to be our customers. Um, and so, 
you know, things could have been very different. You know, I definitely thought sometimes, wait, are we going to just throw resources behind Container Linux? That would have profound implications for how Red Hat maintains things long term. You know, we could say, well, Container Linux for a long time has had a new kernel. RHEL 7 for a long time has had a more stable old kernel and older kernel but with backported features. And then, you know, so, well, sometimes, you know, when, say, Spectre hits and we need to, like, improve GCC to add repolines or something like that to harden the kernel, well, now we have to patch GCC in yet another place. I mean, huge implications. Red Hat Core OS is RHEL content. It's the same kernel, the same user space, supported by the same people because we really don't have any other option. Now, I do, I would love to take more of that DNA, the fast updating model of container Linux into this, and that's a huge topic. Um, not going to dive into that too much. The two technology pillars, pillars here. So it was actually really good because the way I would summarize some of our initial planning is we realized, A, we kind of wanted to do a reset. We knew we wanted to do that on the OpenShift side because the Tectonic installer solved a lot of practical problems with the OpenShift Ansible approach that uh, I won't get into in this talk, but we really like the Tectonic approach. And um, it turned out uh, Ignition uh, was one of the technologies that CoreOS folks like the most, and Tectonic was designed for Ignition. Uh, so I, I'm going to go into that. Uh, and we took the RPM OSG technology from Atomic to replace the sort of dual partition thing. Um, so one of the biggest changes, I'm going to demo this later, is it's not just an OS. We come out of the box with management tools for it, opinionated management tools. The one thing I would want you to take away from this is Red Hat Core OS is an OS that comes with its own operator. Um, actually, when I say operator, how many people know what I mean from Core OS? Some, not many. Oh, OK. I'll, yeah, I'll mention this real briefly before I continue. But an operator is basically, you know, in Kubernetes, you deploy containers, you know, and then you have uh, as pods and things like that. Operators are a way to describe the management of your application as custom resources. So your app itself appears as custom Kubernetes resources, and you can scale it um, and edit it in the same way you do native Kubernetes resources. Uh, and this is by far one of the biggest changes that I'll get to. And again, Red Hat Core OS is designed for OpenShift. Lifecycle bound with it. So let's dive in a little bit. Why Ignition? Um, and actually, if you go to that link, I'll post the slides after. It's actually interesting, because Container Linux didn't have Kickstart. Um, and but it, yeah, so the first thing you'll, you'll see on that page, so basically, it runs very early on boot. And that allows it to do things like change the partition layout, which you can't do from Cloud Init. And Cloud Init has a lot of problems around. It sort of runs in the middle of the boot process, and then you may want to add systemd units. And then like you sort of get into this weird loop where you're booting halfway and then changing what you're booting. Systemd does handle this for the most part gracefully. But it turns out it just works a lot better if you do the initial setup from, from the initial RAM disk. Your system boots, and before it even really runs the main system, you've configured it. Um, and one of the things I think is most compelling for coming from the Red Hat side is Ignition is a single language that for us replaces both Kickstart and Cloud Init. That same, those same configs you can take on premise to bare metal and you can run in the cloud the same way, which, uh, and we built a lot on top of that. Uh, and yeah, the other thing I want to just mention is that Ignition. Unlike Cloud, Cloud Init runs every time you boot, and that means if the config changes, it, it, can, it will reuse it sometimes, and it's kind of a mess. Ignition was really designed to be in the immutable infrastructure model, which I don't like that terminology. I actually like to think of it in terms of controlled mutability. Basically, the idea is you boot the system with the config, and then in container Linux, you get auto updates of the OS, right? Immutable infrastructure doesn't mean you don't apply security updates. right? It just means that your config is fixed and doesn't change, and it does what you need it to do. Um, and it doesn't get applied halfway. If Ignition doesn't work, if for some reason your system D units are broken, the machine won't boot at all. And yeah, well, I'll get into the machine config operator, which extends this model of Ignition. Uh, and yeah, one of the things we did is Chorus Container Linux has SE Linux, but it's in permissive mode. Uh, we did a lot of work. Red Hat Core OS will ship with SE Linux enforcing by default. Uh, and um, having Ignition support SE Linux going out of the box 
It's one of those things we've been doing. And OK, so why this RPM Illustry project? So this was my project. Created it initially. Um, and it's definitely, yeah, so something I'm passionate about is you should be able to plot, automatically update your OS, just like Container Linux. If your kernel crashes in the middle, you should either have the old system or the new system. Applying updates shouldn't be a process that instills fear, right? If something goes wrong, you should be able to roll back. That should always, always work. I mean, this is part of my passion for free and open source software. Like, we, a problem I think I, we always have, and Container Lakes has actually had too, is like, we really want people to try the new stuff and report if it works and if it doesn't, fall back, right? And so that's part of the idea behind RPM Ostry is that always, you always have a known good system to go back to, and yeah, it's transactional. There's a lot of details of this of why it's better than a dual partition system. Um, among other things, it has overrides and layering, and uh, you can build the init room if you want to on the client side, in addition to the server, a bunch of stuff. I'm going to it. Um, Ostry is actually very popular in the embedded space. So it's a proven system. It's worked. We've shipped it. Um, we're going to continue to use it. One thing I do regret, though, and I think I missed part of the vision of container links, was those automatic updates. We never did that for Atomic Host. And that's actually the real, a lot of that real value. It, I, I, yeah, I feel like I missed that now. It's, the transactional part is good, but it's only part of the implementation of actually going all the way to automatic updates. Because it really changes how you think about agency in updates. Like, if I log into a system and I type app get update or yum update and something blows up, it's kind of my fault, right? I typed that command. But if you're doing automatic updates and something goes wrong, all of a sudden it's the person who's providing you that update. It's their fault, right? It, like, I really feel that's true. It changes that sense of agency of the system. And uh, yeah, it's really important to get right. Um, it changes how you think about how you deliver updates. You know, part of what we're going to be doing is staging updates and making sure not everyone gets the same update at once. Container Linux has been doing this for a long time. They roll out, roll out updates slowly. Uh, yeah, and also we didn't have opinionated reboot management. So Container Linux had a couple evolutions of tools. There's Locksmith. It's like, how do you manage the reboots of your servers and make sure they're not all done at once? Stuff like that. Um, one way I like to describe our famous tree now is think about the OS itself in slash user is like a container image. Your Etsy directory, which is mostly configured via ignition, think about like that like a Kubernetes config map. And then your var partition, think about that like a persistent volume. It's not actually implemented that way, but it's a good way to think about it. So container lakes, like I said, derive from the Gentry model, the, the Coral, or sorry, the um, Chrome model of the dual partition. And, uh, that has a custom update payload model. Um, and OS tree was an addition. So, you know, we had three kind of things admins had to worry about. You know, you have to worry about, well, okay, my OS tree versions. You have to worry about your container versions. Um, and, you know, you have to worry about RPMs. And, you know, it, it, yeah, a lot of tension there. So what we're doing for Red Hat Core OS is we're embedding the OS updates inside a container. So you don't have to care about OS tree. Like, the system, once we will just auto-update, and you, yeah, I'll get into this. Uh, yeah, the operator understands how to extract and fly. So one of the biggest things that I think a lot of our customers and people hit is we really want to mirror updates on premise. And you have to learn how to mirror OS tree then too, which it supports. You know, it's documented. You can do it. Um, but you also have to mirror the container images. So this, this basically, by embedding the update in a container, we just solve the mirroring issue. So if you want to mirror all the containers that comprise OpenShift 4, uh, I'll get into the release payload, but yeah, you can mirror the OS just as you mirror your containers. Uh, and as a brief aside, why don't we just make the OS a container? It would be a profound leap into the unknown. I mean, it would impact everything around how we manage the OS. Um, you know, and there are people who are doing this, like Rancher. Uh, they sort of ended up with this dual-level system where you have a Docker and a, a boot Docker and then a separate Docker. Because a lot of people just want to blow away all their container images. You don't want to remove your OS, right? You have to teach Podman, how do you handle this special container? We're not going to go there, right? Um, so this is probably one of the biggest changes, though. Like, the simple lifecycle binding problem, we created huge issues for ourselves with 
rel, so basically rel 7 came out, then containers happened, so we added rel extras, and then we added OpenShift on top. All three of these things run on different life cycles. I, I mean, it's hard to even describe how much pain we inflicted on ourselves with this, and uh, yeah, it, it was, and we added OpenShift on the side, right? So you have this, this huge matrix. So we, or I added atomic host on the side. So with Red Hat Core OS, we're making an OS that's always tested to run Kubernetes and OpenShift, right? Like that, because the OS itself comes with a container with release payload, that thing that you run, we've tested that vertically as a stack, right? Um, and so, yeah, we have that OS container. Now, one of the biggest changes in OpenShift 4, which I'm only partially covering here, is this concept of a release payload. So there's one container that has references to all the other containers that comprise the platform. And there's a high-level operator that manages all the sub-operators and deploys those new containers on updates. The operating system is just another entry in that payload of containers. Uh, yeah, so Hardy, <laughs> again, a lot, lot to cover here. Another huge change we made is uh, we decided to embed the kubelet the container runtime in the host. Like one of the things we tried really hard to do was to containerize the container runtime. So the idea, which again, kind of came from container Linux, is like, well, what about the versions of Docker? I want to use a newer one, or this one newer one has a bug, I want an older one. And so we wanted to try and get to the model where, okay, there is this base we update, but then how do we handle this stuff in the middle? Um, so on the atomic side, we had system containers, uh, which were kind of before Docker, I won't go into a lot of detail, uh, container Linux was developing this thing called Torx, which was designed to like overlay some additional things like different versions of Docker, which was actually in use by Tectonic. So you'd boot the OS, but it would basically ignore the version of Docker in the OS because they wanted, Tectonic wanted to have a vertically tested stack, right? Um, so yeah, th this, is, this is really one of the biggest changes in how we deliver OpenShift. I mean, it's, Hard to even begin to <laughs> describe how many problems we're solving with this. So when I mention an installer, now I'm not talking about like Anaconda or Ubiquity or something where it's like you take an OS and you put on a disk. No, I'm talking about the OpenShift installer. It's a way, when you use the installer, you get a cluster. You don't get a single machine. Um, and so it has an architecture that's derived from what the Tectonic developers called Track 2. So they had an initial installer, and it, had so it didn't have basically have everything under management. Uh, there were some things that were hard to upgrade. So it was redesigned, and we repurposed that and integrated it with OpenShift. So rather than Ansible, the cluster is self-driving. So basically, the installer has a bootstrap node. You boot, it, you boot this one node, and then the masters come up and download Ignition from it. And and bootstrap into a, an etcd cluster. And then from there, you can tear down the bootstrap node, and you have a cluster that's self-driving. Now this is, if you look at other projects, like OpenStack, I think, is a really good one, where it has this concept of an undercloud. It's actually very interesting, because they have um, this project, Ironic, which is still one of my favorite project names, which is basically, let's use the OpenStack technology to ma manage the bare metal. <laughs> you know, like, what if we think of our hardware machines as like, you know, just images like, um, not VMs, but like basically instances and in Nova and, you know, how we manage that. Um, because it really made sense to use that same, if you have an undercloud, it creates a lot of tension. It's like, where do you configure things? And, and, and OpenShift, the 3x OpenShift path had a lot of this tension. It's like, do you edit a Kubernetes object or do you edit an Ansible playbook? These are radically different things with radically different trade-offs. Um, among other issues, Ansible requires kind of SSHing to each node, which is a huge problem at scale. Um, so anyways, the installer, self-driving, which is an immense, immense change. Uh, and so for, for bare metal, like the path that we're going to be following for Red Hat CoreOS is very much the path that container links follow, which is you have a disk image, you copy it to disk, that's it. And then on boot, Ignition runs and configures it. So we don't, have, we don't want to have a kind of, we don't want to have two ways to configure the OS. And this circles back to the kickstart versus cloud in it and 
you know, how I configure my partitions, how I configure different things, it's always ignition for us. And furthermore, the ignition is always under management. Uh, let's see. OK, so not even done with the biggest big changes here. So I mentioned how you know, with Atomic Host, we didn't really end up inventing a lot of management tooling around it. Now, Tectonic, part of the Tectonic group um, created operators to manage the container Linux updates. So, and you really want a team that's developing management to really be integrated with that software. That's the ideal case. So with Red Hat Core OS, we have an integrated team where we, have, we build the OS, and we're building an operator to manage it as if it was a Kubernetes object that's integrated with Kubernetes. Um, so this, this is, again, is a new code base uh, derived from, inspired by, and derived from tectonic technology. Uh, but we've, and it's expressly designed for Red Hat Core OS. You could really think of it, well, it's called machine config operator. You could really think of it as the Red Hat Core OS operator. It's a valid way to think of it. So there's four components. We have a, a pod that's a con, uh, an operator that sort of manages a high level status. Like a lot of Kubernetes objects, we have a controller, which is you know, like a reconciliation loop. It's trying to make sure, it's trying to synchronize the current state to the desired state. If I don't run out of time, I'm going to demo all this. Uh, it also has a component that serves ignition. So when you go and boot a new node, it goes out and talks to the cluster and says, give me my ignition config. And so all that stuff is basically managed by the cluster. When you want to when you want to bring up a machine, that it's talking to the cluster itself for configuration and not some undercloud that's managed in a different way. Uh, and on each node, there's a daemon, a Kubernetes daemon set, that ends up talking to RPM OS tree to do, uh, to do updates and also manages reconciling ignition configs. So if you dive into the machine config operator, there's a, couple, there's a lot of different concepts. There's a concept of a machine config, which you can think of a lot like in a fragment of ignition. So again, when you want to, if you want to configure anything on Red Hat Core OS, which is basically everything between the kernel and the kubelet, um, including the kubelet config, you know, so basically not things that are actual containers, you know, everything sort of in that OS, it would be ignition configs that are managed by the machine config operator. Right? Uh, yeah. So machine config object is ignition. We have some pre-made ones. You can also create your own. And then a machine config pool basically is how we manage rolling out those new that new configuration across the cluster. So again, rather than having an undercloud, that machine config daemon and the operator and the controller work to reconcile state of that operating system from the current state to the desired state. It manages reboots. So making sure that when you want to apply a new config, like let's say you're applying an OS update, it's only, by default, it has a max unavailable of one. So you're only going to be rebooting one node at a time. It makes sure it's to drain all the pods on the node so they get rescheduled elsewhere. And so basically, you have zero downtime updates, right? Uh, all integrated. Uh, in, yeah, so in terms of stuff between the OS and the cluster, it manages SSH keys. So the installer takes SSH keys. You know, you can provision those in the installer. It ends up as an inst installation config, and we can roll that out. Uh, kubelet configuration. And yeah, so we've basically unified config management and OS updating into this machine config daemon. It's all part of um, one thing. You know, if you think about the state of your system, it's basically a two tuple of the OS and the config, right? And that's basically what we manage as a unit. Uh, yeah, OK, so I mentioned the SSH key one. So that's, again, one of those things where, like, the installer uses a technology that's not Kubernetes. It bootstraps itself. But then that SSH key that you provide to it ends up as a config map in the cluster. And then the machine config operator can take over. And if you want to change your SSH keys, you know, you have an admin who leaves the company or something, um, you can edit that machine config, and it'll just get incrementally rolled out to your cluster. OK, so let me try and do a demo here, finally. Um, so, well, I guess I'll just, no, hold on. I need to increase the size. You guys see that OK? So let's, OK, yeah, 10 minutes. Um, let me see, yeah, OK. So, 
So the, I'm logged into uh, an OpenShift 4 cluster right now. So again, I talked about the release payload. There's a cluster version object that describes everything in your cluster, right? You want to know, what am I running? OC get cluster version. There's also OC ADM upgrade to, to find a new release payload and initiate an upgrade to your whole cluster. Again, it's all self-driving. Um, OpenShift 4 is an operator managed Kubernetes distribution. So, you know, you can see if I look at the cluster operators, there's a whole bunch, right? Like how we manage the networking plane is an operator. It's not Ansible. It's not something else, right? The cluster drives itself. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of, yeah, DNS. Um, two of the most interesting ones, in my opinion, are the machine API operator, and, which works in concert with the machine config operator that I've been talking about for the OS. So uh, let's see. And we'll look a little bit. So I'm in the, uh, we'll look at all the, the Kubernetes namespaces that make up an OpenShift 4 install. So, you know, each, a lot of our operators are in their own project or namespace. Um, right now, I'm in, I wanted to look at the pods. Yeah, let me just do this. So this is the machine config operator. So again, if you want to look at the state of the operating system, this is where you dive in. Uh, let's look at the machine config objects. So, uh, I'll OC edit. I'll edit this config. And so if we look at this, again, it's a Kubernetes object. And inside here, I'm going to guess most of you have not looked at Ignition JSON before. But basically, Ignition you know, just has a declarative way to say, create this file with this content. Um, if it's early encoded, which is a, something I want to fix. But you can see here, this is how we, like, when a Red Hat Chorus node boots, it's not configured, right? There's a lot of configuration you have to add. Um, you know, there's obviously certificates and all this stuff. Uh, so the Ignition is managing all that configuration. And yeah, so we saw that. And so basically the concept of the machine config operator takes these fragments of Ignition, and then these last two ones are rendered configuration. It's the final configuration. So let's look at a machine config pool. Oops. Uh, there's two machine config pools. So if I want to roll out a, a create a file on all my worker nodes, you can see here the machine config pool object is part of the controller that's managing rolling out that config or the OS update across my pool of worker nodes. Or, and the same for the masters, right? So if I, try to, if I want to edit the kubelet config, it's making sure, again, to synchronize that desired state with the current state. There's the machine config pool. Um, oh, yeah, and I also want to demo. So let's look at my Kubernetes nodes. An important part of this, this, let's look at this one, which is a master node. So if you see here, the way a lot of this works is through annotations on the node object. So the machine config daemon and the controller work together to say, here's my current state. Uh, and they, they basically communicate by these annotations on the node object. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, this one. And then finally, the uh, operator, if I could type. Machine config operator. If, if we look at the machine config operator, it's basically providing a higher level status. Because a lot of cases, you want to know, how's my cluster doing, which is both the master and the worker. And actually, we support creating um, other types of machine sets, like uh, infrastructure nodes, that sort of thing. So the operator is managing, watching that whole status, and is reporting to the highest level cluster version operator. Uh, and that's what you, so, and so basically, all the state is very visible to you. OS upgrades, again, I just can't emphasize this enough, are represented in Kubernetes itself. Uh, yeah, OK, so let me, one thing I, uh, cool. so I don't have, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Yeah. All right, I'm going to have to skip some stuff. But I, I do want to demo this, because I think it's, it's pretty cool. So. This is showing you, I talked about the machine config operator. Another component that's come derived from upstream Kubernetes is called the, uh, the cluster API machine API operator. And this is basically, you know, in a, in a public cloud, an infrastructure as a service, it's what's talking to that cloud and saying, OK, I want to scale. Let's say I want to scale my number of nodes. So it has a concept of a machine 
which you know you can think of as like an Azure, AWS, OpenStack instance, right? Not a Kubernetes node yet, and you know it has, and that machine set has a number of replicas. You know there in that replica it said two. Now, I, I'm actually doing this demo on a libvirt install on my laptop, but if you want to scale the number of nodes in your cluster, I think this is super cool. Uh, you just say scale up the worker nodes, right? Just like any other Kubernetes object, just like you want to scale the replicas of a pod. And again, this is part of that abstraction uh, across the clouds, right? You know, they all have different APIs. By thinking of things this way, you can take that same management tools, same workloads across public clouds, you know, between AWS and Azure, or you know, to on-premise OpenStack. Um, and you know, you can definitely think about implementing this type of thing on top of a bare metal provisioning system. Uh, yeah, and so when I, again, when I scaled that machine set, that, that new node went out and talked to the machine config operator and said, give me my ignition config, and then it joins the cluster, right? It's under management from the start. Uh, and that's, that's where it begins. Uh, so let me see if I can demo one more. Uh, yeah, I did the overview. Play this. So uh, yeah, I want to demo operating system updates here. So right now, by default, we don't have updates enabled if you, if you try the beta. Um, so this is basically, this is not how we expect you to do updates. This is kind of like, I'm basically overriding the system. But I, I kind of want to show this at a low level. So here I'm SSHing into a node, and I'm running RP Mostry status, which will show me my OS version. Right? Um, there isn't really a YUM equivalent. It's kind of like, uh, and actually we taught RP Mostry how to say, to, to, un, to think it came from a container. Like in that status command, it's like I pulled that OS update from a container. And so here I have an ignition, a machine config object, which is almost ignition, except it also has this OS image URL. And so basically, I created that machine config object, and I pointed at a container that has a new OS version. And then what you can see here, so I have that machine config object, and then a new rendered config, the unified, uh, and that, the, that's a checksum there of all the inputs. And basically, what's going to happen now is the machine config pool is going to say, oh, hey, there's a new machine config. Let me incrementally roll that OS update out uh, to the cluster. Um, yeah, I probably should have edited this out, but I was fumbling around trying to figure out how to edit ASC, ASCII, ASCII casts. Uh, yeah, anyways, you can see it ended, that OS image URL ended up in the, uh, the rendered config. And so, yeah, now what we're doing is we're looking at the machine config pool, and you can see the status changed updating, right? So the, the updated status changed to false. It's saying, I'm, trying, I'm in the progress of reconciling this state. Um, degraded is what happens if for somehow a node goes out of management. Um, OK, I'll get to that in a sec. So I'm, I'm SSHing it in the node now. And you can see OS tree is running. Right? In the background, it's, it's a, getting a new update ready. Now, I haven't drained the node yet. Right? If, your cluster stays running, that node stays running, all the pods stay running until the very last moment where it, uh, the update is fully ready applied, all the config is ready, and it initiates a reboot. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, this one got a little bit broken. So as SSHing in, oh, wait. Uh, play. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this, this ASCII cast got a little messed up. So the, uh, what I'm showing here, is after that OS update got applied, I'm SSHing back into the node. And you can see here that I have, I've rebooted into that new OS version. So because how OS tree works is, you know, I mean, it's not like snapshots. It's, it's like version file system trees. So initiate that new one, and if you need to, you can roll back. Uh, yeah, there's more I could demo, but let me, oh, yeah. Cool. So what didn't I cover? So we're doing a dual track path. We're introducing not just Red Hat CoreOS, we're introducing Fedora CoreOS, which will be, is the upstream for Red Hat CoreOS. Part of it, right? Not the OpenShift part, but the, the OS part. And especially, you know, I've heard from a lot of people who like this, the, some of the CoreOS technologies. They like OS Tree or they like Ignition or whatever. Um, our upstream project to build this stuff is called CoreOS Assembler. Like everything I will work on, it's free and open source software. So if you want to do something custom, uh, that's there. We're going to be maintaining it. Uh, I think it's, it started out some bash scripts, just gluing other things together, but it's, it's turned out pretty well, I think. Um, 
And yeah, so Dora Chorus is our upstream. If you want to improve something, um, please join that project. And yeah, so here's the summary. Red Hat Core OS, operator managed OS designed for OpenShift and Kubernetes. And if you want to try it today, you can get it from try.openshift.com. So that's it. So I think, yeah, I think we have 10 minutes for questions. Yep, yeah, over here. Okay, so the question is, what's, what, what's the boundary between Fedora Core OS and Red Hat Core OS? So, yeah, we definitely see those core technology pieces, the ignition part, the RPM industry part, um, you know, the bare metal installation path. We see all those as shared between Fedora Core OS and Red Hat Core OS. Now, we're not baking in Kubernetes into Fedora Core OS, so that gets into an interesting topic of you know, we're discussing actively right now about Kubernetes and Fedora Core OS, and it gets tricky because we have a project product split. But it's our upstream, but a lot of the higher level components live in OpenShift. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. It's not a good idea at all because we are using our own stack. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we were happy that Core OS is just a minimalistic distribution to run containers. Yeah. What will happen with this? So this campus looks for us, to be honest, ugly. Moreover, I completely disagree that RPM is uh, uh, more used on uh, embedded uh, than uh, two-partition scheme because two-partition scheme is used by Android, and Android is definitely the most so popular OS, system on embedded. We use OS3 by default. So, uh, but, yeah. so the question is, what is the future of CoreOS? Because for me, it looks like that CoreOS is dead, and everything is moving to OpenShift, which is a very okay. bad news for us. OK, I will, I'll take that. So the question here was um, from someone who basically has, they built on top of container Linux CoreOS, and what's that future? You know, they don't want to move to OpenShift. So absolutely, that's where this Fedora CoreOS thing comes in. Okay. Now, it's going to be a free open source project, and it will be resemble in a lot of ways Core OS Container Linux. Now, we've had a lot of discussions about exactly how this thing works. Because for example, Container Linux shipped with NetworkD. Fedora has never used NetworkD by default, and there's a lot of implications to all this. Now, I think we want to have a relatively easy transition, especially because we process Ignition from Container Linux. Now, part of this question was about the dual partition thing and embedded systems. So when I say RPM OS tree, it's actually OS tree by default. It's an image system, not a package system. So it has all those trends. Like, it doesn't use libRPM. Like, it basically takes RPMs as inputs, but it's OS tree that's managing things on disk. So we've rewritten that part. Um, you know, and so if you, I think if you want to do something custom that's not OpenShift, that's where we like to hear from you in the Fedora Core OS project, okay, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yep. Cool. Yep, over here. Okay, so the question is, is there a detail, is there a migration path from V3 to V4? That's a very complicated question. Now, OpenShift V4 is a fundamental rethink of how OpenShift is installed and managed. I mean, and it's something that, you know, I think we all looked at the state of things and said, we need to reboot how we're doing this. And that comes with some powerful benefits. It would have been very difficult to demo everything I've done here with just a sort of incremental path from what we were doing before. Um, now, honestly, I'm, an, I'm a low-level OS guy. Like, you, you talk to me about C code and, you know, opening files via file descriptor relative APIs. And, you know, I live in that world of OS updates and all that stuff. Um, so you're going to be getting more communication about this over time, about how you transition from V3 to V4. And we've definitely been talking about it a lot. I can't give you, like, this is the answer right now. But uh, we're just, we hope to make it an easy transition, I have to say. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, and related to other talks, there are talks about Fedora Core OS, there's talks about Ignition um, and other things. So if you want to learn more about those, please go to those. And I assume I'm out of time. So thank you all again.